Okay, welcome. Today I wanted to offer some reflections about Tony Blair and this book by John Rental, and just some reflections about Tony Blair's experiences of boarding school. I've tried to look uh, online and I couldn't really find much, so I, I bought a couple of his books um, and just really to get more data for our film uh, Boarding on Insanity, just about the impact of boarding school on our leaders. So today I'm going to just share a little bit, some quotes from Tony Blair's books. Yeah, so I guess I preface this by just saying, you know, I'm fascinated in, well, what were the experiences of some of um, the uh, our leaders? And I found it really interesting. You know, originally I bought this book, um, Tony Blair, a, a journey, and I was like, oh, he'll talk about his boarding school, he'll talk about his childhood in here, because I've got John Peel, I've got Richard Branson, David Cameron, uh, Bear Grylls, they all talk about their boarding school experiences, but not Tony Blair. He, uh, he hardly says anything, he mentions Fetis once. So I had to, um, to buy this book here, um, by Rent John Rental, which was published, I think, in 2004. Um, and in it, he talks about quite a, extensively of what went on at his school. So let's put this into context. And, you know, this comes from, this is a quote from Peter Levine in the book uh, Waking the Tiger. He says, the impact of trauma may not be fully conscious, but it is certainly fully active. In an insidious way, trauma contributes to the motives and drives of our behaviour. What this means is the man who was hit as a child will feel compelled to hit as an adult. So I'm going to just take some interesting quotes out of Tony Blair's book. So for those who weren't, who aren't based in Britain, Tony Blair uh, was the Prime Minister of Britain from 1997 uh, till... I'm not entirely sure which year, but I think it was possibly 2011. And yeah, he was, he's, he's still in politics now, but more on a back seat. I think there was press coverage that he was in um, the World Economic Forum last week, um, talking about um, some form of um, identity card. So, this is the first quote on chapter one. This comes from David Kennedy, uh, one of Blair's teachers. He says, he has always been conscious of how he appears to other people. The facade is always there. He is very intelligent and calculating. Don't forget that he was a superb actor. So I think this would be an interesting point if bringing in Nick Duffel's work of the strategic survival personality. He says not everyone is traumatised by boarding school, but everyone has to survive. And we create these survival personalities. He says there are three main types. Um, complier, rebel, or the crushed. And in, you know, the, the name of this first chapter is the cheerful rebel. So this was the characteristic he used to survive. So essentially, in this first year of boarding school, he went age 13. He was beaten really badly. I'll find some quotes from this. Uh, less from the adults, but more from the older boys. So there was a thing that in the house, it was the 16, 17, 18 year old boys who could beat the younger boys. And some of them, he talks about this in the book, is that they literally would run up so they could hit as hard as possible. Um, so he was born 6th of May 1953. Um, so Blair did not like being away from his family. He hated the harsh discipline and the practice of fagging, where junior boys were allocated as fags, effectively servants to seniors. Blair was fagged to a prefect called Michael Gascoigne, now an Edinburgh solicitor, who recalled him as cheerful and, and efficient. Blair would clean my shoes, blanco my army belt and polish the brass on it. If I couldn't see my face in it, 
he would have it thrown back at him. He would also, if it was games afternoon, lay out my rugger kit on the bed for me or my whites if it was cricket. The house they put me in was very old fashioned. We new boys had to fag for prefects, especially um, for prefects and I always resented that. The boys at Fetis were called men, especially the new men, and were required to call prefects sir. Prefects were allowed to cane junior boys, and Blair was beaten for a number of petty infractions. This was still a cool practice, with the tradition being allowed a day in the sanatorium in order to recover from a thrashing having only recently elapsed. Depending on the gravity of the offence, prefects would line up to take their turn with the cane and the more sadistic would take a run up. So um, so that was his first year. He was beaten really badly and he was basically a slave servant. Um, so that's his experience. And if we come back to that quote of, you know, Peter Levine, it says, what this means is the man who was hit as a child will feel compelled to hit as an adult. Now in, you know, from a trauma point of view, you know, where has Blair hit out? And if we look at the war in Iraq, you know, a lot of the British public were against going to the uh, going to Iraq. And yet, from a psychological perspective, the man who was hit as a child will feel compelled to hit as an adult. It's like they want that conflict because that's what's happened to them as children. So this is what Peter Levine is, is saying in his book, Awaking the Tiger. So, um, so the first year goes by, so he gets chosen to move to a new house. But um, I've mentioned this before, but essentially age 14, he's meant to be going back to boarding school, he runs away. And it says here, 14-year-old uh, Blair then made his way to Newcastle Airport and said he managed to get on a plane to somewhere like the Bahamas before being asked for his boarding pass. The airport authorities then telephoned the headmaster of Fetis who telephoned his parents. So essentially, he had hated his school so much that not only did he try to run away, he tried to leave the country. And I just think, you know, to put that into perspective, that, for me, as an ex-boarder, very few people ran away at my school. Very few. Uh, those that did were really uh, being bullied horrifically. And, you know, maybe once a year, someone would try and run away. The one who was... As uh, Richard Beard talks, the custos, that, that person that was being hurt the most. And so that just shows me, you know, the impact of that first year. Um, so these are Tony Blair's words. I was a pretty dreadful teenager. I have this constant feeling of guilt for my poor dad. And then someone else, uh, Nicholas Burnett, who was at school with him, he says... Um, about Blair, he says he was certainly keen on being noticed, whether it was for his views or his pranks, he liked the attention very much. So just seeing, you know, this thing of leaders, it's like this wanting attention, you know, because I feel one of the traumas from boarding school, as Nick Duffel says, is that we feel we're not good enough. We've been abandoned. We're being, you know, as Joy Chavron says, the A, B, C, D, that A is abandoned. We've been abandoned. You know, what that means on the psyche is I'm not good enough. I'm not loved. And yeah, so Blair is very rebellious, essentially. And one of the things he struggles with the housemaster over is the enforcement of rules. Um, he was good at sport at the beginning. And he also talks here about the analogy with the prison camp was a dominant one with the boys and much of their energy was devoted to try and leave, trying to leave the grounds to go to pubs, shops or to chat with girls. So this is a common theme in so many uh, boarding school books. John Peel talks about that. About um, I think even Eddie Izzard talks about being an inmate um, Bear Grylls talks about being a prisoner, counting down the days to the leave day. And again, this is another thing, Tony Blair, Stephen Fry, he said the same thing. He said boarding schools were like prisons. So again, this is, you know, this is his experience. 
Uh, and then he talks, page 18, John Mentor, who talks about there being a paedophile, a well-known paedophile who was coming to the school. And it was kind of laughed off. But you know, again, this was very common for these schools. And in um, the Panorama's documentary a couple of um, a couple of months ago in the in in Britain on BBC, Ian Wares was at Fetis around a similar time, and from what the documentary says, it's like there was rife abuse going on in these schools. So it says here about this guy called Cunningham. Cunningham was the sort of man who liked boys. He never did anything as about it, as far as I know. But that was about. That was what he was about. Cunningham liked to go through to the boys' quarters to provoke them with his outrageously reactionary views and encourage them to challenge school rules. So, yeah, I, I could talk for more, but what I found fascinating, again, in this book, he doesn't talk about his experiences at all. There was just a few bits that I was like, oh, that's very much... Uh, an expression of boarding school syndrome. He says here, in many ways, I'm very emotionally self-sufficient, in some ways too much so. And so just him saying, ah, oh, yeah, I struggle with emotions. And as Nick Duffel talks about, he says that the principal effect of boarding is a struggle, is a problem with emotions. This is not only actively encouraged by the traditions of the school, but also a survival tactic. I know. So, yeah. I will stop there. Um, yeah, so I've got an interview with um, Mark Stibe, uh, Stibbe, um this Friday, who wrote the book at Home at Last, which is about his boarding school experience. That's going to be great. And I've got another couple of podcasts lined up over the next few weeks. The film, we've got the documentary, uh, the retreat, we're just putting that together at the moment, so that's exciting, um, you know, to find out, okay, what's the experience? Having uh, a leader like Tony Blair, David Cameron, again, was beaten, and I'll talk about that, you know, please put into the comments below if, if you want me to talk a little bit about his experiences, but just to see, ah, okay, these people are in positions of power, could it be that by being traumatised, as Peter Levine says, you know, further on in another book, he says the effects of unresolved trauma can be devastating, devastating. So here he's, it's being written, he's being traumatised. You know, what is the impact on the rest of us? Does that affect his decision making? And so, you know, what trauma is showing is yes, it does. Um, so. Well, thank you so much. Um, any questions, uh, please leave them below.